Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the last of my six talks before I retire and leave the rest of you to take care of Bose Corporation without me around with you. Um, I want to thank you for coming, and I hope you find some ideas of lasting value in what I talk about today. Today's topic, the most personal one of all, developing oneself and developing others. Uh, I've never supervised a large body of people, but I've had many, many, many relationships with many of you over the last 36 years. And I've been very thoughtful about those relationships, and I hope you'll find something useful in what I've thought about. I will, of course, start with this now famous quote by Dr. Bose in a memo that he produced in 1996. He wrote very few memos ever, and he wrote this because it was so important, and it contains words that are unlike anything I've ever seen written by someone in a corporation. My vision is for each and every one of us to be able to work in a climate that allows individuals to reach their fullest human potential. What an extraordinary sentence. You just wouldn't expect to find the words fullest human potential at all in a memo in a corporation. What's behind this is a really, I would say, a pair of really extraordinary ideas. And the first one is that we all generally think that the purpose of a company is to fulfill the fullest human potential of its founder or founders. We all think we're not here. Our name, uh, our name isn't on the building. We're not here to fulfill our fullest potential. We're here to fulfill the fullest potential of the people who founded the company. And Dr. Bose kind of turned that right around. And he said, well, what would fulfill me the most, my vision for what I want this company to be? is that it be a place where your dreams can come true, not just mine. So it's a selfless view that we don't expect from a founder. And it was clearly genuine, because I remember many times when he was so happy to show off to visitors something new that had come out of the lab, and his greatest moment of pride was when he could say, and I had nothing to do with this. He was so proud that this had become a place where things like that would bubble up from people like us. And it wasn't just his ideas, it was our ideas. The second thing is that we are acutely aware that for a company to survive, it must serve its customers, it must serve society, the public. And there is the natural tendency to think that fulfilling our own fullest human potential might be not getting the job done in terms of our commitments and our necessity to serve the public at large. So you might expect a founder to say, I don't care about your fullest human potential. I want you to make our customers happy. That's what's important. I want you to make this company prosperous by paying attention directly to the customers. Don't be thinking about your own personal growth, your potential. And again, Dr. Bose did not see a conflict between these two things. It's clear that he would not have made this such an important goal if he had thought that by doing so, he was going to cripple the future of the company in terms of its ability to satisfy its customers. So it must have been the opposite that he believed that by creating an environment in which we can potentially fulfill our fullest human potential, that this might be the best way possible to serve our customers. I agree with that, and I think as we walk through this um, presentation, you'll see why I think those two things are very, very strongly connected, as opposed to in conflict. 
But clearly this is not the sort of message that you would normally expect to see within the context of um, corporations. So if we scrutinize this sentence, we see that for all employees it creates two responsibilities, not just one. The first is that it talks about a climate. Each of us is part of the climate that everyone else experiences. So for each of us, there is a responsibility in creating, helping to create a climate. And then for each of us, there is the question of what about reaching our own individual fullest human potential? So there are two responsibilities encapsulated in that sentence for every one of us here, for every employee that Bose has ever had or ever will have. <clears throat> Create a climate that allows others to reach their fullest potential and to face the challenging difficulty of discovering what our own fullest potential might be now that we hopefully have a climate in which that becomes possible. So this nicely divides into how we help others and how we develop ourselves. And I'm going to take it in that order. I'm going to start with developing others and the climate that we hope to create. Creating a climate for others. You know, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but for me, one guiding principle that really covers them all is this quote from Goethe, and it's on my door and has been for a couple decades now. Treat people as if they were what they should be, and you help them to become what they're capable of being. In other words, when I think of any one of you or anyone I've met, I like to think a little ahead of who you are today. I like to think of who you could be, and I like to think of treating you as if you were a little ahead of where you are. And I think that that may encourage you to actually move into that space that is being offered to you. Often I see that happen. We have many relationships within which we have the opportunity to do this. Um, there is the employee-supervisor relationship. A little less commonly, there is a mentoring relationship. There is the leadership that we express when we attempt to influence other people. There's giving advice when someone comes and asks, what do we think about an idea? Or can you help me with a problem? We're often engaged in teams, and teamwork is another important part of the climate. And then the last and most general one is citizenship. Our relationship to one another is in terms of the essence and values of Bose Corporation. So I have something I want to say about each one of these things. Some of these things will be obvious if you have personal experience in those areas, but this is a record that I want to be complete. So it will contain some things that may be obvious to some, and it will contain other things which I hope you'll find unusual and new. So starting with the employee-supervisor relationship, I haven't supervised a large number of people. Uh, I don't think I've ever supervised more than two at one time. But each time I've done so, I've thought long and hard about what is required of me as a supervisor. What does it take for me to be a good supervisor? What is the essence of the relationship between these two parties? I want to know that so that I know that I'm carrying out my responsibility because I understand what it is. So the answer that I came up with, what I think the quid pro quo is, that's Latin for this, for that, is that the Half of it is pretty obvious, and I think is seen in every corporation. The supervisor says to the potential employee, if you will help me to shoulder my responsibility to the company, which the supervisor cannot shoulder on his or her own, uh, one person alone, if you'll help me do that, I'm going to give something to you in return. And what is that thing? That's the more obscure part of the quid pro quo. And decades ago, the answer might be, pay. You get pay and you'll be able to feed yourself and your family. Um, but that is not enough. The power balance is not that inequitable. 
we ask for much more than pay. And additionally, in Bose Corporation, there is this question of what about allowing individuals to reach their fullest human potential? The supervisor clearly has a really central role to play in that part of the climate. So what I decided is what is underneath the surface is the following. If you will help me to shoulder my responsibility to the company, I will open a door of opportunity for you that you want to open, and you can't open it all by yourself. But it's a door I can open for you. Whatever that opportunity is, whatever it is you want as an opportunity that you can't get on your own, you come to me and you say, I'll help you shoulder your responsibility if you can open that door for me. So when I supervise, I talk about this quid pro quo. And if it hasn't been raised before, it's something for the employee to think about. What is the door of opportunity that they would like to have opened? What is it that makes them want to work at this job as opposed to another job, separate from whether or not there is a pay level or a different pay level? What is the opportunity that they want? It is a challenging question, and it's in its deepest form, it is the question, what do you think is your fullest human potential? What is the path that you think you are on that leads to that? But it usually doesn't have that degree of depth to it. It's usually something a good deal simpler. When I came here, my first job, I came to Bose because I wanted to, to learn. I wanted to learn how to design loudspeakers. That was the opportunity I wanted open to me, and I could not open that myself. My boss, Bill Schreiber, could open that for me, and he wanted my help in shouldering his responsibility. So I came to Bose in the first day, and discovered that I was to be put in charge of designing a loudspeaker. My opportunity was right there in front of me. A much bigger challenge than I expected to be faced with. Which leads me to the next slide about the employee-supervisor relationship. I've tried to supervise others as generally as I was supervised um, by earlier people in this company. And I want to call attention to a few of the things that were part of how they supervised me that I carry on. Some of these I hope are obvious and don't even need to be said. Um, but they are the ones that are important to me. First of all, I was, from the day one, provided with responsibility, perhaps more than I felt I could handle. I was provided with inspiration. It was exciting what I was doing. I was working on a consumer product that I'd never done that before in my life. And confidence. People expressed confidence in me. On that first day, I told my boss, Bill Schreiber, but Bill, maybe I oversold myself in the interview process. I don't know how to do this. He said, that's all right. You're going to learn how the rest of us learned by doing it. And he knew that I could learn that here because he knew that there were a large number of experts that I would be able to rely on. And that's the other thing that I expect of employees. There's lots and lots of smart people here. Rely on them. Seek out expert opinions. But you are responsible. You are the one who's going to make the decision. Get the best information that you can. Get more information from more people if you don't like the, if the first piece of information isn't, con isn't uh, convincing. So rather than see it as a sign that you don't know what you're doing, that you're often in someone else's office asking for an expert opinion, this was the means by which I was really expected to survive. And all up and down the engineering hallway, there were open office doors. And I was completely dependent upon those people for an education for the first two years. My boss undermanaged me. He, he didn't leave me twisting in the wind, but he certainly didn't coddle me. He expected me to figure it out. And if I was having trouble figuring it out, to know who to ask. So uh, it's actually, as a supervisor, we have an ulterior motive for doing this, which is it makes our job a little easier if we're not actually running and fetching all sorts of things for the employees. That's not the real reason. The real reason is to give room for the employee to grow into capabilities, to leave it a little underdone for them, 
so that it's a stretch for them. But to stay close, be there, and always be ready to help and advise if the employee seems to be getting out of their depth. Ultimately, what I learned was people blossom when you believe in them. I am certainly a beneficiary of that. People believed in me far beyond what I believed in myself. And if I blossomed, it was first and foremost because others believed in me. Mentoring is a different relationship. Sometimes a supervisor can mentor, but there's one requirement for mentoring that a supervisor really can't fulfill. And so in a sense, it's very useful to seek out someone else who is senior who can act as a mentor. In the first couple of years, I had a number of mentors here, and it was just incredibly valuable to me. Later on, a few years later, I didn't have any mentors, and I really struggled. I really had a lot of difficulty. Um, what do I think the mentoring relationship is? Right now, I enjoy mentoring so much that I am mentoring five people regularly, and a few more drop in from time to time, some of whom I have mentored in the past. Uh, I find it a deeply rewarding thing to do. First of all, I offer mutual confidentiality. Whatever is discussed between me and the person I'm mentoring, I will not discuss that with anyone else. If their supervisor comes to me and says, I'd like input for, say I'm mentoring someone named Fred, um, I'd like input for Fred's review, I say, well, you have to talk to Fred about that. This is a, this is a private relationship with him. Um, I'm not monitoring him for you. I want that to be mutual because as a mentor, I may want to share experiences that I've had that I don't particularly want spread around publicly because they may be of value to the person I'm mentoring. They may offer a perspective to that person. After all, the reason they're coming to me is I have experience that they may not have had and they want the benefit of that experience. I want to be able to share that and that requires that they be confidential with my information. I offer them my undivided loyalty. That is to say, I am not a representative of Bose Corporation when I am mentoring. I am in their corner only. So if they want to talk about how they're thinking about going to work for another company, we can talk about that. And I will be honest with them about that. And the confidentiality will mean that they can trust me and they, that information will be safe with me. And if I think that they should leave, if I think that's the best path to their fullest human potential, if that's what I believe, that's what I will say. This is why a supervisor may not be able to be the most effective mentor because none of us as a client to a mentor really wants to go to our supervisor and say, I haven't really made up my mind, but I'm thinking about leaving. But you can say that to a mentor. And a, a good mentor will be able to come to grips with that and help you with that. Of course, in our role of hoping to create a good climate at Bose, we will hope that the mentor can think of a solution. But if the mentor cannot, then helping that person by encouraging them to do what I think is right is what I believe I should do. The relationship is personal because growth is personal. We are not talking here in the mentoring relationship of, tell me again about the wave equation. It's not about that. It's about the edges of who we are. It's about the place where we go from our comfort zone to a place where we're not comfortable and we're not sure and we're groping and we're fumbling and that needs to be, we need to create an atmosphere of trust and safety before these things can be brought up. And you don't really have the opportunity to talk about things like that at the lunch table. You may be able to talk about them at home, but the people at home don't have the experience of the climate around you here. So if you go home and say, I had a meeting with so-and-so today, they don't really know what that might mean. But if you were to come to a mentor here and say, I had a meeting with so-and-so today, and you're like, that person's like, oh, well, so tell me how that went. Um, the mentor, in order to make this relationship as equal as possible, should be sharing experience and framing a perspective 
you know, the mentor has probably seen the movie before and can say, I've, I remember similar circumstances and here's how they turned out back then. So that store of experience and the framework of understanding is, I think, the most important thing a mentor has to offer. There is a tendency among some mentoring relationships to do a lot of questioning, to use a kind of a Socratic method where you try to elicit thinking and answers from the person you're mentoring by asking them questions. I don't like doing that because I feel like it's, it's, it's um, reinforcing a kind of a power distance between me and the person I'm mentoring. If I think I know an answer, I will say, well, if I were in your shoes, I think this is what I might do, and here is why I might do that, but I don't know whether that would be really right for you. Rather than saying, well, what do you think your options are in this case? Can you think of any others? I mean, it's, it's just not, it's nothing like the same relationship. Okay. Most people, I, I included, carry around with them a self-assessment that is at a level below how other people perceive them. We think we're less capable than other people think we are, in general. Um, and one of the things that mentoring offers is the opportunity to help people reinforce a more accurate and more positive assessment of themselves in a way that is separate from the employee-supervisor relationship, which has so much performance requirements built in. You can feel that a mentor is being more honest with you when they tell you what they think of your capabilities. And most of all, most important of all for a mentor is, you may not see it on the surface, but there's always a power struggle. And the mentor should be very careful to lose that power struggle. You are not there to control the choices this other person makes. They must remain in control. You are, as the mentor, are to lose that struggle. Offer them your ideas. Do not pressure, do not push. They get to choose. Leadership becomes more important as time goes by because there's only so much work any one of us can do. And so, as we generally go through our career, it is often the case that more and more of what we, quote, accomplish is accomplished by means of influencing others to do something that they otherwise would not have done. They would have made a different choice. So developing the skills of influence is very important to most people's growth and career path. I took one of the Bose leadership courses, Leadership of Excellence program, in 2001, and they had a section on influencing others that I found to be particularly memorable and useful. And so I'm going to plagiarize it liberally on this slide. They talked about three different sources of influence. And I had only, up to that point, thought about one. The three they talked about are expertise power. That is to say, it is the influence you have over people because they think you know what you're talking about. So the more they believe that you know what you're talking about, the more you are likely to influence them. There's another form called relationship power. And this is really personal relationships. They like you, you ask for something, they're inclined to be influenced by that. Okay? These two are in green rather than white because when we use these, kinds, these two kinds of influence, it has a tendency as a byproduct to actually strengthen that source of influence in us. So if I am going to use, if I use my expertise power uh, to influence someone, and the outcome is good. That strengthens my expertise power. So the use of those two types of power tends to make the person using them 
actually have more power. There's a third kind, which is the obvious kind that we all know about in the business context, which is role power. It is what it says on your business card underneath your name. That is, it's the place you have in the org chart. And that power comes just from the position that you hold. It has nothing to do with whether or not people like you. It has nothing to do with whether or not they think you're competent. That role gives you a certain degree of authority. But in 2001, I didn't realize that that was not the only kind of power. In fact, it isn't even the most used kind of power. And not only that, it's in yellow here because when a person uses their role as the source of influence, do it because I'm the boss, instead of strengthening their ability to use that role, over time it actually either has no effect or even may weaken their ability to use that role. So when I think back to some of the early leaders of the company, um, folks like Joe Varanth, if any of you remember him, who's our um, Vice President of Research, Research and Development. Um, Joe was an entirely approachable human being, and I can rarely, if ever, remember him actually influencing people using his role power. He was always influencing people using his expertise power. He had prodigious expertise, and to some extent his relationship power. We respected him tremendously as a person, in addition. Now, there are these resources of power, and there are a variety of responses to the exercise of influence. And they should be fairly obvious, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. The response you're hoping for is commitment. That is, after you've influenced someone, they go, I get it. That's wonderful. I want to help. That's what you're hoping for, the energy of the commitment. Sometimes all you get is compliance where they say, yes, I'll go along, but my heart isn't really in it. They may not say that, but that may be the fact. Or you may even trigger resistance, that for whatever reason, the influence you've tried to exert generated a response of resistance. Now, in between the sources and the responses, there are specific techniques, some of which are more likely to lead to commitment, and some of which are more likely to lead to resistance. So the methods the tactics, if you will, that are likely to lead to commitment are the ones that you see getting used at bows a lot. First of all is reasoning. Logic. Give them a reason why they should be doing what you want to influence them to do. Make it logical. The other that has a lot of capacity around here is inspiring. To call attention to the wonderful outcome if we do, if we follow that path. Both of these are green because they tend to lead to commitment. Consulting. In 2001, I wasn't using this very much, and so it was good to have my consciousness raised. But since then, I've done it a good deal more. And the classic example of this is when you come to someone and say, I have this plan, but I don't think it's as good as it could be. Can you... Work, can I go over this with you and maybe you can help me to strengthen this plan? Let's add the ingredients that you think are important. Okay? <coughs> it's a terrific way of making your plan stronger and generating allies, people who have commitment in the same things you do. There are some supporting tactics that can help you, especially when they're used along with the primary tactics. Recognizing is a good thing. Rewarding, recognizing publicly people when they do the right thing, when they, when they do something that you wanted them to do, uh, strengthens your ability to influence them, but not to the same degree. Um, and one has to be careful not to overuse these three techniques that come next. Exchanging. You have resources. The other person that you're trying to influence has resources. You may say, I'll loan you some resources so that you can do something you want done if you'll loan me some of your resources to do something that I want done. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. It's not a bad thing, um, but it's not the sort of thing that raises the level of commitment in an organization, raises the level of passion and energy. Coalition building. This one actually makes me a little nervous. Um, this is where you get together with a few others and combine forces in order to try to influence 
other people. And that can be healthy, but it can also lead to the next two kinds of influencing, which generally have negative outcomes. One is establishing authority, do it because I say so, do it because of my role, I'm the boss, or do it because it is company policy and that's what you have to do. Uh, and the other is pressuring. A coalition has to be careful because it's so easy for a coalition to start pressuring people. Um, we all know what pressuring is. It's, it's when you've said you would do something and somebody calls you up every other day saying, have you got that done yet? They know they're pressuring you, and you know it too. Um, at very best, these two red techniques will lead to compliance over the long haul, and they have a tendency to erode both the power of the person using these tactics and also the response. The response tends to get worse the next time a per the same person comes back trying to establish authority or trying to pressure. So what was wonderful for me about this is a lot of detail, but it laid it out, you know, I was going to say in black and white, but in red, green, and blue, red, yellow, green, um, what techniques experimentally have been shown to lead to what kinds of outcomes. This was very empowering for me, and it was also very helpful because in my role, I don't have a whole lot of power. Most of my capability to influence rests upon what you believe about my expertise and how you feel about your relationship with me. And so when I look back at my career, I see that I had, once I understood this, that I was diligent about building my ability to influence based on my expertise power and my relationship power. Because I wasn't that interested in having a role in the organization that was high up in the org chart with a lot of people reporting to me. It's just not the way I would prefer to relate to people in the company. Not a responsibility I wanted. So this opened that choice to me and made it a practical alternative. You can see this kind of tactical and uh, uh, sources of influence going on around you every day. Uh, it's, it's actually a very wonderful thing to watch, to see who's using what sources of power and what kinds of methods and what kinds of responses they get. Um, so this is all part, one, once you have the awareness of this, it becomes part of your ability to influence the climate itself by what you choose to do and by how you influence others to act. At very low level abstraction, most of us have the opportunity to give advice on somebody else's idea fairly frequently. And the metaphor I want to use for this is the idea of guiding their passion. When someone comes to you looking for some help, they have in mind some particular goal. And you'll discover that they have some passion that is leading them towards that goal. Now, an engineer will consider a quantity that has a magnitude, and passion has a magnitude, and a direction, and passion has a direction, as a vector. So I think of a passion vector. When someone comes to me for help, I'm assessing what is their goal and what is their passion vector. Where does it point and how, what is its magnitude? And the more they tell me, the more I begin to get an assessment in addition of whether I would agree with their goal or not. And sometimes I do, in which case I'm happy to give them the help that they're asking for directly, which I hope will increase their passion in the very same direction that they're currently pointed, towards their goal. It will help them directly towards what they already want to do. But sometimes, I have the sense that they might not be headed in the right direction. I might think that they should be going in a completely different direction, and I'm picking a direction that is very far away from the person who has walked into my office. Now what do I do? Well, over the years, I decided that I would limit myself in how I would influence people and see how that worked. What I did was I said, I'm going to make sure that however I influence these people, I am not going to decrease the magnitude of their passion. I'm going to try to be really careful about that. Now that doesn't mean jollying them along towards their goal if I think they should be going someplace else. It's not easy, but it is possible and there is a basic technique for preserving that person's passion while 
you have the opportunity to redirect them in a way that may even increase their passion. And the technique is to go back with them to where you are on common ground with them, where you both agree about some things, and then begin to work forward, perhaps towards their goal, perhaps towards where you think they should be going, together. And as you do that, you will either be convinced by them that their goal was the right goal in the first place, or they may convince you, or sorry, you may convince them that your goal was the right thing in the first place. But what is most likely to happen is, during this process of coming forward from your common ground, you're influencing them, and they are influencing you, and eventually, the two of you together discover a mutual goal, which might or might not be one of the earlier two. And at that point, that person's passion, because you've worked together, is now pointed at that mutual goal. And they walk out of your office more excited than they walk in, even though they may have completely changed direction. Now, if you, on the other hand, think they're going into the wrong direction, and you think that the most productive thing you can do is step on their passion, so that they can, and tell them where you think they should go, and then leave them to rebuild their passion in that direction, okay? Um, do you think they're going to come back again next time they have a problem? So think ahead. This is all about influence, not just about the effect that the influence has today, but the influence that it will have later. If I restrict myself to the making the effort, the extra effort, such that Everyone who walks out of my office is more excited that when they walk in, almost no matter how long that takes, then I think I've got a pretty good chance that next time there's some challenge that they might face that think, think, they think I might be able to help with, that they'd be eager to come. And I'd be eager to have them because if they walk out with more passion, I feel really good about that interaction. So I think that it takes extra time to do it this way and I think it is totally worth it. Teamwork. Uh, we are almost always in a situation of working on a team. And I want to talk about something that I observed that's going on beneath the surface of a team. We'll start out with what is on the surface, which is each team member has some essential requirements that they must champion. If you're the quality representative on the team, you must champion the needs of the quality of the product. If you're the acoustical per engineer, you must champion the sound quality of the product. Okay? Initially, all of the team members are championing factors, requirements, that begin in conflict with each other. We don't start with a solution that meets all the requirements. And so, what shall we do about that? Well, what happens in a good team is that Teamwork is something that borrows our human instinct to have communal unity, to motivate that team to find a solution that includes everybody. It's a deep psychological effect of human beings. It's not the only one, but it's a powerful phenomenon. And so what's happening in that team is we're creating a little community there. And the goal is to feel a sense of community and to feel a sense that everyone in the community is valuable and that in order for them to stay included, we have to figure out some kind of solution that includes everybody. Because including the requirements starts to look like including the person. And that's what makes the connection between our instinct and the effort that we put in to find a technical solution. That's when a team works well. A healthy team struggles until nobody has to lose. But it doesn't always happen that way. And if you watch in a team, you can sometimes see that someone looks like they're about to lose and that their particular requirements are going to be shoved aside because nobody can figure out a solution that actually includes those. And the personalities in the room favor the, 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 the there are stronger personalities in the room than that particular champion. And when I see that happen, I try to raise this perspective to the people in the room. I try to make them aware that 
we're all going to lose if we have to let go of any, any, what is precious to any one of the people in the room. That we are called upon to continue the work until we find an answer that meets everyone's requirements. Citizenship. This is about the essence and values. We have a really good climate here because of the essence and values. And those values do not uphold themselves. We have what we have because others before us have defended those essence and values when they were in any kind of danger. And that is a benefit that we all have. It's something that we start with when we arrive here. But now it is our turn to stand up for those benefits. We have benefited from, and we do benefit from, the good climate that we have in terms of essence and values. And like I say, now the responsibility falls on all of our shoulders to actually not just be obedient to the essence and values, but to uphold them when someone else is not being obedient to those essence and values. This takes a lot of courage. There's no two ways about it. It just takes guts. Um, the thing when I've been in this situation, and it's been a few times, a number of times, I've really seriously been in this situation. Um, the thing that always motivated me was when someone told me that they believed that we would all benefit if I was to step up and step forward. And that was something that gave me the courage to do it. It was to do it for my community, not for myself, and not to put down someone who is um, transgressing, let us say, the essence and values. It's extremely difficult. I acknowledge that. And it's important that we be able to do this. So when your turn comes, think about that. Think about the importance of it. Think about how precious what we have is. And it is now up to us to preserve it. It is also important, and one of the things I love about Bose Corporation, is that we act against the behavior, not against the person. I myself am a beneficiary of getting a second chance uh, when I have transgressed the essence and values. Because to be true to our ideal of creating a climate in which every individual has the opportunity to reach their fullest potential, we must recognize that the person who is currently transgressing is someone who also deserves the opportunity to reach their fullest human potential. And the first step in that must be for them to let go and come back to the essence and values. I was offered that chance. I'm intensely grateful for it. I've seen it happen over and over in this company. I think it's one of the most wonderful and precious things that I've ever seen. I want to give you one very low level concrete example that may not be so far out of your experience. Um, when I came here, I went out to lunch with a group of people every almost, well, once a week, let's say. And almost every time the same thing would happen, people would complain. They would complain about somebody or some department who wasn't present. And they would, they would just rant. And, and say, that person has no idea what they're doing. What they really should do is the following things. And being the young and earnest person that I was, I drank all that in. And then I went back to the company after lunch, and I would try to find that person. And I would sit down in their office and say, hey, I, I heard an idea um, that I thought I would pass on to you in case it was of value to you. I heard someone suggest that maybe it would be a good idea to do, and then I'd say whatever, you know, um, respectfully clad uh, was suggested at lunchtime. And after a while, I began to notice a pattern in the response to these uh, overtures of mine. Um, people were very patient with me because they could see I was honest and I really wanted to help. And they would patiently explain some things that weren't known to those people at the lunch table. Every time. And as a result of the things that they explained to me, the course of action that was proposed at the lunch table looked not particularly smart. And the course of action that they were taking looked eminently logical. And after this happened a few times, 
I realized what was really going on. That I had fallen in with a group of people who were playing a game. It's not really about how do we make the company better. It's about patting each other on the back about how smart we are, um, about agreeing that we think we know how to do somebody else's job. It comes from bitterness, ultimately. That bitterness expresses itself as frustration about somebody who's not within reach. Um, and we want validation about that bitterness. And people around us might be bitter too, and they're willing to give us the validation if we give them the validation. So that, I decided, was the way that game gets played. And when I realized that, I decided, hmm, I think I'm going to pick a different set of people to go to lunch with. And as a junior member of our society, I think that's an acceptable thing to do. Nowadays, that would not be an acceptable choice for me. Nowadays, I would have to step in and try to make a change in that situation. But without being disrespectful, without calling anybody out, how do I turn something like that around? Well, not everybody in that group has the same degree of bitterness. And so one way that I think is worth trying is to simply say, wow, what could we contribute to that situation? How could we help? Because now we're changing the subject. It's not about can we amplify on how incompetent somebody is. It's can we amplify on what we might do to make things better, which might be just as simple as going and having a conversation with that person to try to get on the same page with them. If it doesn't work the first time, I'd try it again. I'd keep on trying to change the subject because it's the subject that we should change the subject to. What can we contribute? When something's going poorly, how can we help? Not who can complain loudest. That is all I want to say about the climate we create for each other. But before I turn to developing ourselves, are there any questions or comments that have come up as a result of what I've shown you? Yes. The microphone? Sorry. We do want to capture it for posterity. So I guess the question comment is about that last little story you told. Um, so it when you went to talk to the person that they were complaining about, you got some new information. Yes. And, you know, so what, one, of the, one of the things, and I've, I've been in similar situations where I thought, wow, this is really headed in the wrong direction. But when I dug a little bit, I realized that I just didn't have the information. And then the question comes up, should I have had that information? Mm. Um, and so I think there are two sides to this mm -hmm. and one of them I mean of course if people really are just you know wanting to have something to complain about that's one yeah. thing but you know if generally there is information that people ought to know and then they wouldn't be so worried about it then there's perhaps a responsibility to bring that to the attention of the person who sits on the information and hasn't shared it yeah so that was just Thank you. I think that's a very timely comment because we are in a period of rapid change here in Bose. And we are all feeling a little uncomfortable that we might not have enough information to really understand the logic of what is going on. Um, our leaders are trying to respond to that by communicating more freely, more copiously, but frankly, it's not at all easy to keep up with the pace of change. So you are right. Um, it is helpful to recognize that they do probably know what they're doing. It's unfortunate that we may not be able to have access to that information as quickly as we would like. Um, I certainly think we could do somewhat better than we are, but in fairness, the faster the change, the more latency there is through the system. That is, the more some people are operating on some pieces of stale information. You are fully up to date about some things that other people have stale information on. And 
they are fully up to date on things that you have stale information on. The best thing I can say is that the root cause of the real problem I was pointing at is the bitterness. And one, shall we say, um, I won't say it's curative, but one treatment for bitterness is to believe, rationally believe, that those who are making decisions are not likely to be highly irrational people. They're probably about as well informed as anyone would be in their position and maybe better, and they're logical, rational people. So a choice that doesn't look like it makes sense, it's easier on me if I give them the benefit of the doubt and say, I, I presume that they must know what they're doing because the explanation that they're completely incompetent just doesn't hold water. It's too easy. We, we know that's not the case. They're clearly not incompetent human beings. We're just frustrated. So own, own your frustration. Don't put it off on them and say it's their incompetence. All right? we, have to, we, have, we all have some work to do when change is rapid in managing our own frustration. And giving others the benefit of the doubt, I think, is a very centrally targeted way uh, to do that. Yes, microphone. So this um, topic of managing bitterness and um, people complaining, I've observed it before. And one of the things that I keep in mind that I think helps me through it and also helps me lead others through it is some guidance that um, Finn Arnold gave to a, at a leadership course that I took. And it was just two principles to keep in mind in any interaction that you have with anyone at Bose. And that is, assume the person you're talking to, no matter who they are or what they do, are very smart and are very good at what they do. And also assume that they care, like you do, very deeply about the success of Bose Corporation. And so if, if, if you can bring that attitude to an exchange, I think it fosters this whole approach that you're talking about. And it's also, I think, a very simple way of, of um, providing guidance to others who are in that situation. Say, the person you're talking to is smart and they care about bows. If you can assume that of them, which is true, that will help you through the situation. That's great. I think that's really wonderful. Thank you. Yes, can you pass that mic back? Um, yeah. Can you give an example of, you know, maybe you don't have one, but interactions with Dr. Bose, back to the earlier concept of redirecting people's passion. Is there any one example that stands out for you where you saw or were part of um, Dr. Bose redirecting someone's passion to something else? Dr. Bose had the confidence, perhaps, to redirect people by doing things that I would consider, and perhaps the person being redirected would consider, uh, felt a lot like being thrown in the deep end of the pool. <laughs> he had a lot more confidence in us, frankly, um, than we have in ourselves. Uh, I, I will, I'll tell you one example. Um, I don't know if it fits your requirement, but I remember Mike Rosen uh, talking at Dr. Bose's memorial about walking down the street with Dr. Bose in Japan. And uh, at one point, Dr. Bose said, this is because Mike was in automotive systems at the time, Dr. Bose said to Mike, well, you should learn Japanese. And Mike said, well, I'm not particularly good with languages and so forth. And Mike then said at the memorial, he says, I didn't realize the conversation was over. <laughs> so he learned Japanese. I, I, don't, I, I don't know whether he's good at speaking Japanese, but he learned Japanese and for years he lived there and he was the hands-on engineering manager for our uh, Japanese engineering subsidiary uh, serving our automotive customers in Japan. I think I, I should move on. These are really good additions, so I, I thank you, but I want to be mindful of uh, the amount of time that we have and, and try to get you out of here more or less on time. So turning to developing oneself, um, a more personal topic. 
And I'm going to start out with sort of the easy, kind of tactical kinds of things that have helped me um, and that I have passed on to others and seems to have, uh, seem to have helped them. And the first one is an exercise. I think the good title for it is Know Thyself. Um, some of you are going to recognize this one. Every now and then, when I feel that things aren't going particularly well for me, and I'm not quite sure which direction I should be going, I get out a piece of paper. And I draw a line down the middle of the piece of paper. And over on the left-hand side, I write something like, I really enjoyed. And I start putting down things that in the last six months to a year that I really enjoy doing here at Bose, regardless of whether anyone else valued them. They're not necessarily the things that are going to show up on my review. Maybe nobody values them. But boy, did I enjoy them. And then on the other side of the paper, you know what I'm going to put over there. I hope I never have to do that again. There are some things, surely, within the last six months or a year, which I know that I really didn't enjoy. And they might even show up on my review as accomplishments. But that's not what this piece of paper is about. This piece of paper is about knowing myself, not about knowing what the company thinks of my work. We get plenty of opportunity to learn what the company thinks about what we do. But unless we do the exercise ourselves, we don't really have the opportunity to confront all in one place what it is that we, our own, our own evaluation of what we've been doing for the last six months or a year. Did we like it? What did we like about it? So once I've put these things down on both sides, um, I ask myself whether I can see any patterns in it that weren't apparent to me before. Because we do not come with an owner's manual. We're not born with something that explains what we're going to be good at or what we're going to be poor at, what we're going to like, what we're going to dislike. We discover it through experimentation. And we have to be watching the results of the experiment or we don't learn. So this is the place and the time where I watch the results of the experiments to see what I can learn about myself that I didn't know. And I've learned some really important things over the years from doing these um, exercises. One of the things I learned back in the 90s, I think it was, was I saw that on the left-hand side that I said, I really enjoyed collaborating with so-and-so. And I really enjoyed collaborating with such and such. And I really enjoyed, and there was about four of them there. And I thought, well, there certainly is a pattern there. I really enjoy one-on-one -on -one collaborations with people on their technical project. And I hadn't seen that before. But once I saw it, I began to gently change over time what people were expecting of me to the point where I had more opportunities to work one-on-one -on -one with people in that particular role. There's another thing which I found which I did not like. When I first came here, I was a project engineer. And then soon after that, I became a project manager. And a little after that, I decided that I was as good a project manager as I ever expected to be. And I'd really rather not do it anymore. I really don't like the whole process of organizing resources in time and space. I just dislike it. And gradually, I've moved my job slowly so that people aren't asking me to do that kind of work. But they are asking me to do one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships on technical programs. And eventually, that is what led to the mentoring that I do, because it starts out helping someone with the technical challenges. And before you know it, you're helping them with their growth. So the patterns aren't always what you might initially think you would find. But if you do the exercise, you may see things about yourself that you didn't know. You may discover that you really like working on a large team, for example. Um, or you really like working on your own. Uh, the kinds of things you find uh, 
might be very different than if you asked yourself specific questions, which is why I like this very open-ended format. What did I enjoy? What did I not enjoy? Um, there have been times when I've been doing this exercise every six months and trying to act gently on the, the outcomes. I've had very few uh, times in my history at Bose where I've actually jumped and made a substantial change of my job. But this could have shown me that I needed to do that too. Uh, in fact, if I had done this early on, I probably would have known sooner that I really needed to move from product development into research. So I highly recommend it. There's a phrase going around now because of a recent TED talk by Amy Cuddy. And I recommend the talk to you. Uh, it's it's uh, very emotionally intense. And her message is, fake it until you become it. And I realized that I had learned over the years uh, a very, very similar lesson, uh, perhaps a little broader than what she talks about in her TED Talk. So I'm going to talk about a couple of aspects of faking it until you become it. But the bottom line is, what I have learned is that over time, our actions define who we are. What we choose to do, even when it is difficult, even when we feel like it's not us, even when we feel like it's fake, this defines who we are. And the more we do those things, the more we become the person who does those things. So we grow, we change, we become different from who we were. When I first came to this company, there is no possible way that I could have stood in front of you like this and given a talk at all, much less a talk on a subject like this. Not just because I didn't know about it, but just because I defined myself as someone who was terrified of giving talks. But gradually, by acting as though I were not terrified in giving talks, I gradually got to the point where I'm generally not terrified giving talks. <laughs> Success, in, here's a good example here. Success is generally correlated with a slightly excessive belief in yourself. You probably know people like this. They have a slightly inflated view of themselves. Hopefully not enough that you would consider them to be a jerk. <laughs> but just a little, they're just a, just a little full of themselves, you know? Like, they're not as smart as they think they are, right? Well, you know what? That kind of attitude about yourself is actually correlated with greater success. Experimentally, apparently. Um, and I saw this in other people. And I literally decided, you know, I am going to act as though I were one of those people. I'm going to act as though I believed more in myself than I think you think is warranted. <laughs> Hopefully not so much that you'll think I'm a jerk. All right? that I'm inflated way out of all proportion. But just enough so that you go, he, he could get himself into trouble because he, he's not as good as he thinks he is. Well, people like that get themselves into trouble, and then guess what? They pull it out. They, they, they make it work, all right? Uh, and so I decided I would do that. And indeed, this is what has happened. I've gotten myself into things that I just thought, oh, what have I done now? Boy, I should not have, should not have played that game with myself. Um, but I've pulled it out. Every once in a while, you're juggling all the plates and they all fall on the floor, but never too seriously. Um, so I recommend this. I recommend asking yourself, what do you think other people think of your capabilities? And then act as though you believed you had just a little more than that. And I think you'll find that it will lead to your increased success and increased satisfaction. You will become what you have acted as. Another example, when we are learning rapidly, we feel stupid. It's the same thing as if I were lifting weights. Suppose I'm a, a bodybuilder and I'm lifting weights and you look at me and say, look at the weights that guy's lifting, huge amounts of weight. Um, what am I feeling? 
uh, I almost can't do it. I feel weak. And if I can't stand how that feels, then I will not challenge myself to try to lift all that I possibly can. So when you are learning, you will feel stupid. We all do. If you can't accept that feeling, the way that feels, you won't be able to learn very quickly, just as you wouldn't be able, you have to challenge yourself to the point where you're feeling like, well, I'm really kind of floundering here. I'm just huh, not really sure. Hopefully not that you're just you know, completely out of control and have no idea, no clue. Uh, but the point remains, when we are learning rapidly, we feel stupid and we are limited in the speed at which we can learn by our ability to tolerate that uncomfortable feeling. So I recommend learning that that's what it is, that feeling, and just accept it, that it's a sign of you growing. I mentioned this a little bit earlier about my anxiety about giving talks. Performance anxiety is the energy that helps us perform. If we didn't have that anxiety, we would not have the same capability and energy to actually deliver. In fact, if I wanted to put it more succinctly but more narrowly, I would say that stage fright is stage energy. <laughs> And if you saw me before this talk started, if you filed in, I was over in that corner, totally slouched out, eyes closed, and I looked totally relaxed, didn't I? <laughs> I was just trying to keep from freaking out. <laughs> um, this talk means a lot to me. And yes, I got a lot of energy. And I used to interpret those feelings as stage fright, as fear of failure, of the feeling that failure was imminent. And gradually I learned that even though I felt that way every single time, the talks were generally successful in terms of my evaluation and in terms of what people told me about those talks. So I gradually learned to reframe it and say, that's not really stage fright. That's the energy that I'm going to bring to my performance. This is really powerful. Open your mouth and say the truth, which takes practice. I'm looking at you, Cliff. <laughs> this is something he has said to me. Um, nothing more powerful than the truth. But initially, we don't have the courage to just say it. We are, we are earnest people. We care about each other. And when you open your mouth to speak the truth, when you feel that way, only good is going to come from that. And so I gradually learned that there are things that I would have thought are undiscussable, that can be discussed, that I could never have discussed until gradually I practiced putting myself a little further out there and saying the truth, being available to other human beings, um, and that strengthens over time. It becomes a source of a sense of honor um, and a sense of capability, and it strengthens relationships with other people. Ultimately, the message here is that we actually are who we are pretending to be, that who we are is not defined nearly so much by what it feels like inside, because we're the only ones who are privy to that. Who we are is what other people experience of us. And we have more control over that. So I might be afraid while I'm up here. But what you perceive is who I am, even though inside I might be feeling nervous. And I believe in what you, in, that I am what you perceive. We become our actions. And this is the source of how we can change ourselves over time. And that brings us to the core of the subject, the absolute core, which I've been staying away from until we save it for last. We get back to that original requirement that if this is indeed a place that has a climate in which we have the opportunity to reach our fullest human potential, what does that mean to us? 
what, what should we be doing with that? How do we frame that challenge? I never took a course in this in college, neither did you. What, what, how do we figure out how to do this, given that we are told that there is an opportunity to do so? Well, here we have evolution, eat, survive, reproduce, and then we get to the human being. And facing this question of our fullest human potential is a little like this cartoon. What is it all about? Is it really just about eating, surviving, and reproducing, and nothing else? Is that it? What is it all about for human beings? What is the nature of our fullest human potential? I found a quote, someone found it for me, I, I, I love it, um, from ancient um, Hindu scripture. I'm going to try to pronounce that. Brahad Aranyaka Upanishad. Got that from Wikipedia. So the quote goes as follows. You are what your deepest desire is. Now, before we go on, that seems on the face of it like it just couldn't be really true. It's, it just sounds like some kind of mystical fluff, right? I, that's what it looks like. Because you are a physical being, your deepest desire is an abstraction. So what are these sages saying to us? Is this going to have any useful content? So here comes the argument in favor of this statement. As your desire is, so is your intention. Your desire leads to your intention. That's natural. As your intention is, so is your will, a firm decision upon which you're going to act. As your will is, so is your deed. Each of these is connected like links in a chain. As your deed is, so is your destiny. Your deeds, driven by your deepest desire, add up in the end to your destiny. And I will change those words, destiny. Your deepest desire, when you follow it with intention, with will, with deeds, leads you to your fullest human potential. But this isn't the answer. This is just explains a part of the problem. What we don't know yet is, but what is the deepest desire? What is our deepest desire? What is my deepest desire? What is your deepest desire? What is our deepest desire? Well, we can go back to the cartoon, eat, survive, reproduce. These are genuinely, extremely deep desires. Any living being should have these desires. They're incredibly important. But for human beings, there are more. We are a social species. We survive in groups for tens of thousands of generations at least. Humans could only survive when they were accepted into groups. So as strong as the survival instinct is, for humans it leads to the need to belong. We, all of us, need to belong. Now you might cognitively say, oh, I can get along in the wilderness. Well, yes, with 21st century technology, I'm sure you can. Um, but that deep, deep species desire is there. We desire to belong. How can we belong? Why would we be taken in by a community of other human beings? Why would they accept us? Well, in order to make sure that we will belong, that we will be accepted, we have a deep, deep desire to contribute to the group so that we will be accepted, so that we will belong, so that we will be safe. We desire to contribute. What does that specifically mean? What, what is contribute? Well. It has two steps. The first step is we are powerfully motivated to think of some benefit to our community that the community does not currently have. 
something new, some benefit it doesn't currently have. And we're powerfully motivated to go and do the work to bring that benefit to the community. Or, so there's two parts to contribute. There is the imagination, and then there is the work to try to make what you imagine available to your community. If you do these two things, you feel you have contributed, and you feel that you belong. And others, recognizing your contribution, feel that you belong as well. Or, in the language of our 50th anniversary video and book, the two parts represent a dream of something better and reaching to make that dream come true. So what we see here, what I believe, is that dream and reach are the words that are at the core of what we must do if we wish to reach our fullest human potential. We are human beings. We are deeply in need of making a contribution. It is who we are as a species. It's why we don't live in caves. We live in cities. We live in skyscrapers. We live in beautiful homes. Birds fly in the air. We fly to the moon. All of that comes from the deep human desire that we share to contribute. In fact, I would say this is what makes humans unique. Humans are the species. It's not the big brain. It's not the opposable thumbs. It's not the bipedal posture. We imagine a better world, and then we make our dreams come true. That is the essence of what makes us different from those other creatures out there. That is what gives us nobility. That is what fulfills us. We have a dream. Each of us finds a dream, something only we perhaps could contribute. And we make the commitment to follow that dream. Now, I want to be more specific than that. I want to actually bring it down to as close as I can to a procedure. Because dreams are kind of ethereal, and you know, what if, what if you reach and you don't find a dream? What if you, I, I can't catch a dream? Where, where, do dream, where do these things come from? Um, before I got involved with the first dream that I worked on, which was Auditioner, I didn't know where these things came from. They didn't seem to come to me. So I was very surprised when I found myself thinking, someday, I hope, people will be able to click in a computer model of a room and hear it as if it were all around them. And I'm going to work really hard to try to make that happen. And I'd never wanted to work that hard before in my life. And I worked for months on it because it was so important to me. It wasn't anybody else's dream. No one was saying, Chris, here's your dream. Came in the mail today. Okay? My boss wasn't saying, I have a dream for you. Okay? Um, to some extent, we may be picking our dreams, but to some extent, they may be picking us. I, it's a little metaphorical, but I've never been sure that when I recognized that I was in the grip of a dream, that I was really in a position of having a great deal of choice. Some choice. So, let me take you through a procedure that I have developed over the years, and I have a mnemonic for it to help me remember the steps in the procedure. But to do that, we have to go to the place where the energy really comes from, a place that I think of, honestly, as the engine room of our human potential. This is where the stuff really happens. This is where the energy for skyscrapers and curing diseases and all sorts of things like symphonies comes from. So I want to share that. I want to share my understanding of that place. And it comes down to four words in sequence. And the first one, of course, is dream. The dreams come to us. If we're not receptive, we don't notice them. There are opportunities all around us to improve the world around us. And if we are receptive, 
we can start to feel a sense of involvement with some of them. These dreams are always, how do you recognize them? They always have some, two things in common. One, they are of benefit to our community. They are something that would be good in your view if it came true. And the second part of it, unashamedly, is that you imagine yourself playing a central role in delivering that benefit. Don't hide from that. That is what it's all about. That is what it's about for human beings. You have a role. You can deliver a benefit. So there's, I, I, I can't be as satisfying about this step as I would like to be, except to say that when these ideas come for something that might be better, that you might be able to contribute, ask yourself, how do you feel emotionally about that idea, the idea of that contribution? What you're looking for there is a feeling of deep desire. I felt that feeling about Auditioner at a certain point. I felt the deep desire. I felt that feeling when I met the woman who has become my wife. Within weeks of knowing her, I felt the deep desire to marry her and spend the rest of my life with her. You'll know because when you reach the point of touching a dream that has that degree of meaning for you, you'll practically shake. You'll practically have tears come to your eyes because it means so much to you. It's so precious. And the tears come because you can hardly bear to think of what it would be like if it didn't come true. It means so much. But only if you're receptive to that feeling, only if you let yourself be aware that you have encountered something that means so much to you. Nothing more personal than that. Now, once you've noticed that and you feel that way about something, there is this question, what should you do about that? A lot of us just cast it aside. We feel like, don't want to take the risk. Bad things could happen. I have a day job. Um, so there is a tendency when these dreams come to us and offer the, the, the feeling of desire to push them away, which is really, I think, rooted in a sense of uncertainty, a sense of fear. And we tell ourselves, well, it'd be really hard. Maybe it's not even possible to make that dream come true. Well, we don't dream about easy stuff. We don't get that feeling about stuff that's real easy, like what should we have for dinner tonight, OK? We get that about things that are real hard. But we can't get that feeling about something that's impossible. And it took me a while to figure this out. But for example, I think it would be very cool if I could flap my arms and fly around the room. That'd be really neat. I think all of you would agree that that would be really neat. But I can't get shaky about that. And I can't get tears coming into my eyes about that. Because honestly, I don't believe it. I don't believe it's possible. But a dream that I can get that shaky about, that I can get tears in my eyes, this is already clear evidence that you believe that one is possible. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel that way. You couldn't feel that intense if you didn't believe it was possible. So what I suggest is that when you feel that desire, that deep desire, that you admit to yourself that it's evidence that you've already added up the possibilities and that you know it's possible. Not easy, but possible. And you know how much it means to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be feeling the way you're feeling. This is your heart speaking to you in a loud voice telling you what is important to you. This is your fullest potential calling you. 
knocking on your door and asking to be let in. And that is the next step. You can choose. You can say, not this dream. But the fullest potential involves taking the next step, which is now that you know it's possible, now that you know your heart has spoken to you in a loud voice, you can essentially submit to your dream. You can dedicate yourself. You can say, I admit what I'm feeling. I admit what I want. And since it is what I want, I'm going to be loyal to myself. And I am going to dedicate myself to making this dream come true. When you have done these three things, as I have done them multiple times, there comes a feeling, not perhaps at once, but this is a combination that brings incredible potential, incredible power. You can become, with these three steps, you become the irresistible force. There isn't anything that can stop you once you've made this dedication. I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying there won't be obstacles, and I'm not saying those obstacles will not stop you. I'm not saying you can get through any obstacle. I'm saying you can hit the obstacle, and it won't prevent you. It won't stop you. It may stop you there. You will go around. You will look for another way to do it. You don't need to give up on the dream as long as when you think of the dream, you still feel the desire. If the desire is there, you have concluded, despite any failure, that it is still possible. And you can continue your dedication. You can keep after it. I have pursued dreams across 18 years. I have pursued dreams that have been crushed, and then I would not let them go, and crushed again, and I would not let them go, because I looked in my heart, and I felt the desire still there. The design talk that I gave um, two talks ago represents a new opportunity for a dream that I had in the early 2000s that was crushed three times. And eventually, I lost the job that gave me the chance to do that work. And I lost the people who were reporting to me. And at that point, I let go of that dream. Dreams die hard. They don't die easily. Otherwise, we wouldn't all be here. We wouldn't be sitting in comfort. We wouldn't be looking forward to a warm meal tonight. This is something that human beings are incredibly tenacious about. We're incredibly powerful about this. We don't have to give up. As long as you feel the desire, we don't have to give up. So over and over, we can dedicate ourselves to making the dream in our heart come true. No matter how many times we fail, if your desire is still there, once more into the breach, make that dream come true. Now, I mentioned that at, with these three ingredients, you can be an irresistible force. You can be something that no person can stop you. Uh, n nothing can prevent you from continuing to pursue that dream, no matter how many avenues have failed. But you can do this in one of several ways. Some ways of doing this, some ways of acting as the irresistible force, are terribly antisocial. They are brutal. They are horrible. And in fact, they are a betrayal of the dream itself, because the dream begins with the idea that you're going to bring a benefit to your community. And so now here, when, once all of this power has come from your heart, you're using that to crush someone, to kick them out of the way so that you can get to something that's beneficial to your community, that's corrupt. That's not what you should be doing with all the capability that comes with dedication to something as precious as this. Instead, I use a different word that helps me 
channel all of that productive power that comes out of this engine room and make sure I'm channeling it in a good direction. And that is the word deliver. Now, I don't mean that at the end of all the work that you deliver the benefit to your community. I mean that as soon as you have dedicated yourself to making the dream come true, that the first thing you have to do is start delivering to solutions to people who have valid reasons or objections to that particular dream. And the first person in line is your supervisor. You have to deliver something to your supervisor in order to make your dream come true. Because, remember what I said, you have a quid pro quo relationship with that person. You've agreed already that you're going to help that person shoulder his or her responsibility in the company. And in return, they will open a door of opportunity for you that you can't open for yourself. Well, now you know what that door is. You can go to your boss and say, I figured out what opportunity I want you to make available to me. In return, I will still, I will do what you are asking me to do. That is the pathway that leads to your dream. I'll give you a beautiful concrete example. When we introduced Auditioner to the field engineering community who were the first users and we gave them a week of training, we wanted them not to take this thing and stick it in the closet. We wanted people who were committed. This was going to be hard work. We wanted people who were totally, totally committed. And so I asked those people, is it your dream that you have this tool and you become one of the world's best field engineers and you have to carry this stuff through airports and live in hotel rooms and work with clients knowing that you are one of the people who makes the cutting edge of engineered sound using this tool. Is that your dream? Because I don't want to give it to you. I don't want to give you this gear if it isn't your dream because you'll waste it. I want to give it to somebody who has that dream. The final exam for that week only had one question. What is your dream? Now, people lost sleep. Students lost sleep. Students called their spouses and had long conversations. It's a tough question. And it was a wonderful privilege to be in the room to hear one at a time the students would come in and in general they would have a smile of serenity on their face because they knew they had done the work they had thought it out they knew what their dream was and some of them were happy to say of course this auditioner thing is my dream I've been waiting my whole life for this and others could say with confidence nope thank you otherwise I might have taken this and gone down the wrong path this is not my dream but I have figured out what it is and I'm going to pursue it Remember that dreams tend to be pro-social. They are dreams of a benefit. They're not disruptive. It's not like you can talk to 40 field engineers and say, go pursue your dreams and, and expect some kind of chaos to ensue. It doesn't. Because those dreams are dreams of benefit. They are the opportunities that those people want to have in return for the work that they do. And the one explicit case where this was true was Michael Johansson, who was our sole salesperson at the time in Scandinavia. He had one boss, supervisor in that region. And he came into the room and he said, I would love to do this, but my boss, I'm the only one in Scandinavia and my boss, he needs me to sell wave radios. That's my job. So it seemed as if he wasn't going to be able to get this technology. Well, it turned out that made him very unhappy. So much so that when we learned he was unhappy, I remember just opening my mouth and blurting out, then we made the wrong choice. I mean, everybody else that's walked through this room has been happy with their choice. So we went wrong. We're going to have to bring this guy back in. And I remember, I believe, Ken Jacobs saying, look, I'm not sure we did make the wrong choice. I don't see the fire. Where is the desire? Well. So we brought Michael in, and um, with a little, a little encouragement, he began to show the desire. 
he began to show how much it meant to him. It was a wonderful thing to see, watch him stand up for his dream. And he made an arrangement with his supervisor. He said, boss, if I can double our wave radio sales in Scandinavia in one year, will you hire someone to sell the wave radios so that I can have Auditioner and begin to design and sell engineered sound systems in Scandinavia? Perfect example of quid pro quo. Perfect, right? He's not disruptive. He is saying, I will deliver in order to get a chance to make my dream come true. I will deliver all along the way. And indeed, he did. He did, in fact, double wave radio sales in a year. His boss did indeed hire another salesperson to do the home entertainment sales in Scandinavia. And not only that, but before the year was over, given the track that he was on raising sales, he asked if he could have early access to the auditioner hardware so that he could practice, not with customers, but on his own, so that he would be that much more capable when he actually reached the goal of doubling the sales and being allowed to turn his attention toward pro. This is a beautiful example of the way this engine room can work. These four items together, especially this issue of deliver, you have tremendous potential when you are in the grip of a dream and you are dedicated to it. And your creativity will find ways to satisfy the people who are presenting you with what appear to be barriers. The other point is, this is Bose Corporation, and those dreams are precious to us all. So when you come forward and say, I know what my dream is, I know what I want, all of us in the community, including your supervisor, feel that that's a moment for celebration and it's important that we try to make sure, as Dr. Bo's vision originally expressed, that you have the opportunity to reach your fullest human potential by pursuing your dream here. So, that is the formula I recommend to you. And if you've been thinking about the overall arc of narrative here, you can probably anticipate how I'm going to end this with the next step. I'm going to give you the final exam. My question to you is, what is your dream? And I urge you to take it seriously. Because when you figure out the answer, you will be on the road to achieving your fullest human potential. Thank you. Class dismissed. <laughs>